So I'm going to play, if uh, you don't mind, the, uh, the role of a devil's advocate here. Um, and I would challenge you with some, some questions or, or opinions. So as I, uh, I would also ask you to be very open, transparent, and, and honest on, on whatever I ask to you. Uh, of course, the, the audience, uh, at least be open to, to raise your hand and, and also uh, join. Um, to, to all the group, but particularly maybe to you, Jose Antonio, uh, that you started. Uh, in the, with, with regard to a ABM, evidence-based medicine, uh, evidence-based medicine has three fundamentals. One is, uh, yes, the evidence, the scientific evidence uh, um, coming, resulting from research, published, uh, and all the hierarchy that you commented on, the, the pyramid and about cli clinical trials or mental analysis on the top and blah, 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 all that stuff. But two-thirds of the, of the pillars of evidence-based medicine refers to patient preferences, values, opinions, cultural aspects, and so on. And the second one is the physician, uh, physician's uh, experience. So two-thirds of EBM refers to something which is not based on raw scientific or pure scientific data. So as introducing this value of the personal experience and the patient preferences, so as at the end it is, at the end, in the mid, uh, they, they, they draw this as a three circles with something in the middle, which is the optimal decision for that individual patient, not for the average patient. And this is the, these are the three bases. So... Isn't it implicitly or even explicitly inserted into the EBM, the, the patient or the person-centered uh, approach because of this of these point? So as our, aren't we speaking more or less of the same? And maybe it is a, a misunderstanding of what EBM put, in, uh, put on the table at the time it, it emerged. It was more a matter of, hey, guys, we cannot take our decisions solely on our personal experience or whatever the patient thinks, or even just the personal experience. At that time, even the patient was not on the equation at all. It was uh, the autoritas um, top-down uh, story, so. Okay, Joaquin, thank you. Thank you for the, for the question, it's, it's very good one. Uh, I agree, no, that when you read some of the fundamental papers of, uh, on evidence-based medicine, they talk about uh, the, the pure, strong evidence for, from clinical trials plus patient perspective, uh, judgment, etc. But in my opinion, this is a uh, pure theory, no? because when you read the, the uh, results of evidence-based medicine group, Cochrane, Cochrane collaborations, systematic review, etc., they systematically ignore the perspective of the patients. They don't talk about preferences, they don't talk about judgment, they don't talk about this two-thirds that you mentioned, two, two pillars that you mentioned it before. They are completely focused on the first one, on the, the, the research uh, evidence from clinical trials. This is the reason why I believe that they are realizing that uh, evidence-based medicine needs to uh, reinvent the concept and they are now pushing you know, in the direction of the individual patient. But uh, I guess, I guess, and this is also my own opinion, that probably is too late, too late because evidence-based medicine has been a very uh, radical movement, no? And again, one thing is what they write or, they, or what they wrote at the beginning, and a different thing is what they apply, and it's completely different, no? So this movement of a person-oriented, health, person-centered healthcare is for me a clear complement to evidence-based medicine, no? because I, I think that they are not going to redefine or rediscover the, the essence of the movement. So, I, I, I mean, that tension don't necessarily exist, although there is some gap in terms of whether there are sufficient research to measure public opinion and, in, in, indeed, patients about, you know, the value of what they are getting and the benefit of what, what, what they are getting. But I, I, I really strongly believe that the patient welcome, you know, interventions which are based on evidence. I mean, they reject hesitation and dithering in terms of the care provided. I'm, I'm, I know a lot of people said earlier that uh, we are not a scientist, we know nothing about science, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, one can debate that forever. But the question is, you know, I give you a lot of example. Patients quite confused about the use of aspirin. 
patient quite confused about the use of statin. Patient quite confused about the use of this and that because the media actually uh, make a lot of interpretation from the debate which we have within the scientific community. You know, having said that, I, and what I said earlier, last uh, sorry, uh, yesterday it looked it sound like last year. You know, <laughs> yesterday that 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 actually we don't have evidence for everything we do. I mean, uh, EBA covers about 10, 15 percent of our practices, no more. You know, so it's not necessarily everything is judged, judged through EBA. So let us, let us not really exaggerating that tension. Yes, there is some tension, but it shouldn't be exaggerated. It's very useful to think of the social science research process as having three stages. The first stage is the ethnographic phase. The second phase is the survey phase. And the third phase is the experimental phase. Now, what is the nature of these phases? At the ethnographic phase, you try to find out a lot about a small sample. In other words, you look in great qualitative depth at some particular issue or phenomena or topic that you're interested in. But what you're doing at that stage, you're trying to do, I would characterize that as suggestive research. In other words, you're trying to identify variables which might be significant and you're trying to identify relationships which might be significant. So what you get out of that kind of ethnographic uh, research, which is predominantly qualitative in nature, what you get out of it is suggestions. Now, when you've managed to identify those suggestions, you can then move on to the survey stage where you try to test them out against a larger population. So whereas the first stage was suggestive, the second stage is more confirmatory. It's really saying, look, what we found in this particular GP's practice, and <laughs> say, you know, was that this particular thing appeared to be interesting because a lot of patients mentioned it. Let's now see whether this is a more generally occurring phenomenon. So you carry out a survey on a larger population. And typically, a survey finds out a little on a large sample whereas ethnographic work finds out a lot on a small sample. Now, when you've gone through the survey stage, the confirmatory stage, you might then be in a position where you feel confident enough about key variables and the relationship between key variables to do something which follows an experimental and possibly RCT paradigm. Now, it's for you gentlemen who know much more than I do to say how does that apply to medicine but I know that that is the paradigm which works in social science and th there have been many studies many PhDs actually where a student will have taken a particular phenomenon do something ethnographic to start with having identified the variables do a survey and then if they're lucky they can maybe build in a little experiment at the end so uh, I would just suggest that paradigm to you, that overall paradigm. How it might apply to medicine it really is for you colleagues to judge. Thank you. I would just like to jump in um, in support of my colleague here. <laughs> I would actually like to challenge the notion, because I'm married to a mathematician and, and who is a, a scientist, the, no the notion that the randomized controlled trial is at the center of scientific research my goodness me, I speak into many of his colleagues and they laugh at this idea that the randomized control trial is at the center of scientific research. It's the best available now. It is and not. Until, until your husband discovers something It better. is not. Yes. Firstly, uh, I'd like to say that uh, I know Dr. Sacristan's work and I know he's very well read in this area. Uh, so he's only touched uh, a fraction of what he knows Evidence-based any decision-making is clearly what everyone should have, but we should not have evidence-based decision-making using the wrong format and framework. Uh, I tried to explain yesterday, we only had 20 minutes, uh, there is no hierarchy of evidence in evidence. Dr. Sacristan and I are ad idem. This is in court. No. This is not in court. We have come to the same conclusions on a number of aspects by completely different reasoning. One of them is there is no hierarchy of ev evidence I, in evidence. I, I, disagree. I disagree with you too, well, Clifford. We, we need let's say your question is about prevalence. 
Surely a survey is, pre is preferable to a randomised controlled trial. Do you want to know about prognosis, a cohort study? Do you want to know about effectiveness of randomised We cannot trial? resolve that today. What needs to be done, and I've already suggested it, uh, we need to have a paper that completely um, uh, analyzes and, and reduces down the whole concept of a, a hierarchy of evidence. Uh, I know it doesn't work in, in, in the legal sphere. I know we can translate the legal sphere into any other sphere. Dr. Sacristan has come to the same conclusion by completely different thinking, not from the legal side. So the first point is that you, if you have evidence-based decision-making of any kind, let's have it on a sound basis. And a hierarchy of evidence doesn't work. I know it doesn't work. You can't take my word for it. You can't take Dr. Sacristan's word for it. Therefore, there needs to be something to uh, show you that it, it, there is none that, that, that's uh, valid. I see your hand. Um, <coughs> in, in relation to randomized control trials, for example, we also have the same uh, conclusion. The randomized control trial is establishing a proof of principle from which normally science starts at that point. And then we go and say, well, why do the 20% respond and why do the 80% not respond? That's where science starts. And we agree with that. You know, we're randomized control. How can that be the gold standard of evidence when everyone else in science will prove a principle and then investigate in detail? What is medicine doing? We're using the randomized control trial as its gold standard of evidence when it, it isn't even off first base. It hasn't passed go. Uh, be, so before Jose Antonio uh, responds to you, uh, I don't think that evidence means randomized control trial, placebo control. Evidence means information gathered in a way and analyzed in a way in order to minimize the likelihood of being wrong. Of course, you might discover through research that in 50 years that you were wrong, even though you conducted a, a, a well-conducted study. But for some questions, a case control study like lung cancer and tobacco, you will never find the answer to that question uh, through a randomized control trial, but the case control was uh, a sufficient evidence, which or is, uh, or, or even, or, yeah, or even some case reports, but uh, it's, not a, it's not a matter of that. And uh, Jose Antonio. Yes, my, yes, uh, my comment is that uh, what I don't like of evidence-based medicine is the, the hierarchies system. No? Uh, I am a clinical pharmacologist, and of course, I am a clear supporter of the clinical trial because it is obvious no, that through clinical trials, we have produced uh, crucial information in, in different areas, in, in the therapeutic area, in, in, in medicines. No? This, is, this is obvious, and we cannot say that clinical trials are not uh, useful. No? But what I say is that uh, the hierarchies are not, uh, are not uh, uh, a good concept. And when you mentioned it before, that you don't see the tensions in between evidence-based I clearly see the tensions, and the tensions are in the hierarchies, because they say only randomized clinical trials. Where are ex expert opinions, judgments, at the top, at the, at the bottom, sorry? Where are uh, uh, individual cases at the bottom? This, they are creating the tension. They are creating the tension, even when they say, if you read one paper or one article that is not randomized clinical trial, stop reading and move to the next paper. I think that they are creating the tension because, again, clinical trials are crucial, the best uh, method to, to establish efficacy, to, to assess efficacy. But you cannot say that the other methods or the other uh, uh, ways to get knowledge are wrong. This is my point. No? Uh, just one further comment. As you will know from my presentation, I come at this from the point of view of program evaluation. And if you're a program evaluator, somebody pays you to gather evidence. And you have to, as they say, do your best. And in the circumstances and the time scale, the way we approach it is we gather as much relevant evidence as we can by whatever means are feasible, and then we are absolutely explicit in the report as to what the evidential basis of our conclusions are. And in a perfect scientific world, I'm not satisfied often with the evidential basis, but it's better than nothing, as long as it's not misleading. Now, in the United States, the Education Department, I can't remember the exact government department, they said at one stage they were not going to fund any program evaluations unless they were based on RCTs. 
well, they didn't find many program evaluations to fund because it's so extraordinarily difficult for social programs to actually set up any kind of RCT. So people then came back and said, well, we maybe can't do a RCD, but maybe we can do a quasi-experimental study on existing data. And I like that suggestion because there's a lot of data floating around in medicine which nobody makes any use of. And a systematic analysis of it within a quasi-experimental design is better than nothing. Um, so is a survey, providing you're explicit about what you're doing. So is an observational study. It's very interesting when we were hearing about family-centered uh, therapy, I thought there was a little bit of con a contradiction because uh, the lady in question said, we haven't got any evidence, I've done a Cochrane study, I found only one piece of evidence, but by the way, here's some qualitative evidence, and she didn't tell us anything about the statistical basis of it, but that evidence then took on a tremendous validity, because it's all there was. So I think we have to recognize that for any social phenomenon, complex social phenomenon that we're interested in, there will be multiple data streams, most of them with imperfections, but I would argue most of them better than nothing, providing when you express them, you express them with due reservations. Thank you. Stephen. Yeah, I just want to say that we've had 22 years of talking about EBM, and I'm quite fed up with it, quite frankly. And one of the things that troubles me, and I'd be interested in the open, candid discussion of this, is my understanding is that the next conference is going to include EBM as a core theme. Why are we doing this? Let's stop focusing on what they're doing and look at what we're doing. You know, we can debate, I kind of personally have a personal position somewhere in between the chair and my friend over here, but it's actually, you know, we've been, we've been talking about this for so long and I think we've got, what's, what I love about person-centred medicine is that after so many years of being in opposition, of opposing, of critiquing, we've got now our own product and we should be promoting it and not worrying about our opponents. Um. Can I just comment? I don't think anyone's saying, I don't think that what's being said, or, and I wasn't saying that you should throw out research methodology, because I think that's what you want to go back to is research methodology, whatever your question, whatever your method, and rather than it being any sort of dominant one particular evidence drives, a type of trial or study drives everything we know. But I think what we have to look at is what's the question. And the question is, how do we best manage these individual patients exactly. who we've got longitudinal data on? We've got a whole lot of information about these individuals. How do we best utilise that? And any other me research methods and that have generated information for us and better manage individuals? It's not coming up with the question about, does this work exactly. I agree for, for, you know, for a population what works for this patient, yeah. it, given their context? I, I agree with Carmel. I mean, uh, without rehashing it all, no. put simply and succinctly, evidence-based medicine is about putting more epidemiology into clinical practice, and I'm not a population average, I'm a person. And Andrew said it all in his, in his papers very elegantly, we need to rehumanise medicine, now let's focus on person-centred healthcare. I think, uh, um, sorry. Uh, sorry, we have a point here, there, and then back here, and I think that we, we should, uh, it is a pity, uh, unless you want to sacrifice the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the coffee, it's up to you guys. Um, I just want to be really, uh, very quick, I just want to try to acknowledge uh, two things that have been said today which we put into practice. The first one is the point you made, Carmel, that within like systems, you need some way of getting pretty quick feedback in order to be able to look at the way you manage things. Um, we, I, I, the, the, the organization I work for provides uh, care, by that uh, delivering massive amounts of drugs to different groups of patients for 150,000 patients in the UK. Uh, we had some operational problems um, which were not terribly well and um, when I was made aware of these questions I asked well what are the individual patients experience of this and what's happening um, oh well we've got our incident register so I said, let's ask the patient sent um, 12,000 um, question at one region in in the UK um, uh, of patients receiving uh, our services we got 6,000 responses within three weeks and, and within those responses uh, we got 160 adverse events Reports that we didn't know. About. Uh, we got 125 safeguarding, which we didn't know about. We got 2,000 
customer service and as a result of that we were able to start um, uh, changing things radically and as a result of that, now we've devised a, a patient safety report card for patients to be able to send back we're not at the real time yet because they post it but the truth of the matter is that patient related outcome measures and patient reported outcome measures are absolutely fundamental to us managing complex adaptive systems uh, and getting them to start changing so i just want to say that you said it was spot on, both of you. Um, and let me just say one thing. I worked in Oxford. I worked with Sackett when, when uh, he was on service doing clinical work. Love him to bits. But when you contact, contact the Cochrane uh, Institute, let me tell you this. The only other body that is so totally unwilling to deviate or hesitate or look at any other way is the European Commission uh, civil servants. So, you know, let's remember that that's the frustrating thing I think we find. The basic point about evidence-based medicine is that the model is wrong. The concept of making decisions on the basis of evidence is correct. We have the wrong model. Um, it's not a question of talking about what the opponents are doing. It's the question of getting the right model. Dr. Sacristan and I have conferred notes. We, are in, we have a very high degree of correspondence and agreement in an appropriate approach. We're not going to be able to do this today. Uh, I had 20 minutes yesterday to present incredibly complex concepts, which uh, these are difficult concepts. In order to persuade people that we need something better, we, we're not going to persuade you this afternoon, we're not going to persuade you in this session. Uh, you've got to go away, you've got to read the papers, go and take a look at what there is, and then you must start to understand. You know, Dr. Sacristan, 15 years ago, started writing about this. What we share in common is that we both have a long-standing interest, and we've come from it from different directions. I know that we can take the legal model and translate it into any other area of activity, and I know it works. Dr. Sacristan has come from a completely different background and a completely different approach, and on a different base of evidence has come to the very similar conclusions. Now, we're not going to persuade you this afternoon. There are the papers. Go away and read the ones I've written. Go away and read what Dr. Sacristan has written, some of the papers he identified in, 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 in uh, his presentation today. And I think there we, the first thing that needs to be done after this is to write a paper demolishing the hierarchy and explaining precisely why from a legal perspective and from a scientific and technical perspective. And I, I think that will be one thing that could you know, help persuade you. Okay, Salman, I, Jose Antonio, I, I close. Coffee. See, I, Thank I, you. I, I, I really think we shouldn't. Uh, uh, I, I have this one here, no problem. I managed to accommodate. You know. I think I think the issue of evidence is, exists be long before David conceptualized the the term. You know, and let us let us be very clear. It is not the start of an era. You know. So, so the, the biggest problem, as Anne Donald mentioned it, uh, she published it in many, many articles indeed, uh, written a full chapter in one of my books, is that even if you have evidence, translating that into practice yeah. is, is, is extremely difficult. Yeah. On average, she calculated that for a GP or a consultant to adopt to new practices, on average, it take about eight years. So we are depriving Whatever the source of the evidence, you know, whatever the value of the evidence, we are depriving healthy population as well as patient of benefit of interventions to promote health or tackle disease simply because the practitioner are unwilling to change their practices. This is more serious to me than, than making interpretation of the evidence or the hierarchy of the evidence, you know. So we need to take that into context because at the end of the day, the beneficiaries here which is our public, our population, ill or healthy, you know, are, are, are not receiving the uh, decant of the process of uh, uh, research findings or indeed the new discoveries or a new innovation. Mind you, 
80% of the discoveries which we have in surgery and medicine and intervention and public health are not necessarily based on research, mm-hmm. you know? Very, very high percentage of things, you no know, small instrument, uh, little observation, etc. everyday happening, you know? That's why the NHS in England, you know, have a dedicated department which is called innovation, NHS innovation, a huge department which is working with colleagues simply because they got an idea and they put huge resources into that, you know, the idea not necessarily based on research, you know, and, and they, they patent that and, and going into the system, etc. I see it on daily basis in my job. Jose Antonio, 30 seconds. Okay. Just to say that uh, I agree with previous comments that probably we don't we don't need to maintain this debate about methodological aspects, no? Because we know that it's a it's a tough uh, one. There are other important topics that probably this society should cover. That is the involvement of patients in clinical research. So far, patients have been very uh, uh, pa- passi- passive uh, agents in clinical research, no? And probably they need to be much more involved in the research process prioritization of the of the research uh, areas participation in ethical review boards uh, having better information about the real objective of clinical research receiving uh, information about the result of the research etc i think this is one of the areas where we have to uh, improve no and go in that uh, direction rather than be only focused on the debate uh, of the evidence methodology etc Thank you. Precisely that, that was one of my final comments uh, to provide with some food of thinking. The patient engagement in research, uh, starting from the study design or even the study operations of the, of the study. I mean, this study is impossible, my friend, and this sometimes should come from the patient perspective because of there are like uh, 20 visits, which is absolutely impossible to happen. Uh, but also referring to the, uh, the patient reported outcomes, the, the new variables to be assessed, but also about the, the patient behavior or the patient results within a, a given clinical trial. So as the sponsor, somehow or somebody communicates or gets in touch with the patient and tells the patient, these are the results of this study in which you participated, and this is what it happened, because nobody's going to tell you what happened with, uh, with that result. So as and so what? And you, you are not going to expect that to, to happen. And, um, and, 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 and. Um, so it's more a matter of the patient as a subject and not as an object of, of research. And this is not happening uh, at all. We started something uh, three years ago and uh, there was the, the idea. And the second point, just uh, to close, um, uh, is a challenge for you that maybe within this society or this association, we, uh, uh, and since this is the, uh, the, I mean the, the discussion on research, we somehow need to demonstrate that a person-centered approach um, has better outcomes on, on patients' health, uh, on results. Yeah, but we need very robust data at that respect of, I mean, being more close to the patient or blah, blah, blah. At the end, it has a tangible result on health, on patients' health. If not, it would be a... We have the empirical a justification that EBM has never been able to achieve within its thesis. I mean, if I may, I know questions are closed, but it perhaps points <laughs> to use a different academic uh, cate- cate- uh, categorization. Um, one thing that has sort of slightly depressed me about, the, about, about all this, and I've, I've kept quiet because everybody knows my I've written extensively about it, but the fundamental problem here with the hierarchy is that there isn't a hierarchy in terms of decision-making. There may, be, there may be different types of research methods, some more powerful than others, depending on the question being asked. Yeah. I mean, surely that is, not deba- that is not a matter of debate. That is clear. It depends on the question. RCT is good for some things. RCT is useless for others. So, you know, don't put it in hierarchy. I mean, uh, horizon- uh, the, uh, horizontally order them and pick from them according to the question. And another thing which has depressed me here slightly is, the, is, is this continuing, and it's such a simple misunderstanding, this continuing, uh, continuing conflation of the word evidence with knowledge. When, when people are talking about evidence, you, when you, a lot of people here have been talking about evidence, they've been talking about scientific evidence. Uh, the no- a knowledge of the patient's preferences is evidence for decision making. A knowledge of the person's so- social and cultural necessities for decision making is, ev- is evidence. So because evidence is a totally useless term, it's been so misused, let's just talk knowledge, scientific knowledge, uh, subjective knowledge of the person's illness and so on. Uh, otherwise the continuing use of this word evidence is causing unnecessary.
Uh, yeah, the, 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 uh, yeah uh, Andrew, the, the only point in that respect, and I, I'm now speaking as a clinician, yeah. is that, well, I don't trust myself because of I, I might be wrong. I'm a human being, so this is more a matter of, so you, you know, it's not a matter of knowledge. It's not a matter of, let's say, facts or even truth. I'm a truth seeker. So as my point is, with my perception on this individual patient, this is the point, I think because if we're jumping from the average patient into the individual patient, with this patient, what is, is the best for this patient? Uh, or is my perception wrong or right? It's because not, at the end it's is... It's not about your perception. I'm it's what the patient is telling you. Not what you perceive. The patient is telling you, I feel like this doctor. I would like you to consider... Yeah, this but, ra but just by chance, but random can explain that. Chairman, Andrew, I am surprised... This is a very uh, possessive paternalistic uh, approach. Um, my perception... I'm surprised you focus on knowledge rather than evidence. I think you are wrong. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Hang on, hang on, listen, listen. We li we're listening to you patiently, you know? The, 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 the biggest problem with knowledge is misinformation, especially among patients. If you look at the amount of information which is given to patients by drug companies, for example, you know, by interested group, you know, uh, we know the misinformation about vaccination given from uh, overzealous people in the United States, the misinformation about certain treatment and certain intervention. These change into knowledge among patients. And what you say, what you propose is, is extremely dangerous. I'm surprised you don't look at it in no, detail. No, no, no. We can discuss it later. Nice discussion. Thank you very much. Let's go to the cafe.